d is really d prime, even though I don't write it that way. It's equal to the actual value of the disturbance minus some nominal value. And usually, if it doesn't change, this is 0. It means that you're just keeping d at the value d bar. Okay? So when you're working with deviation variables and I tell you something doesn't change, I'm telling you it's 0 in deviation variables. And when we deal with transfer functions, they're always deviation variables. Just we get tired of writing it that way. I don't want to put prime, 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 prime. So I'm, it's just implicit if these are transfer functions, it's deviation. All right. So that long-winded explanation is telling you that for this problem, d is not changing. d is 0. So if d goes through this transfer function, as 0 goes through the transfer function, 0 comes out. <laughs> right? 0 multiplied by whatever is still 0. So this signal yd in this particular case is 0. That's why it's not here. You see? It's, I, I set it equal to 0. That's how I got this. OK, what's yu? Well, yu is u going through this transfer function. In other words, it's gp times u. That's where I got this thing. What's u? u is just gv times p. That's where I got this part. You should see a trend here. Um, what is p? p is just gc times e. Okay. So now what I have is I've said, and this goes back, if you recall, when I introduced the concept of Laplace transforms. I said if you have transfer functions in series, you just multiply them together. So if you want to know what's a transfer function between e and y, you just multiply those three transfer functions together. They get this. Same, we, we talked a little bit about this already. Whoops. All right. So now I need to exp express what e is. So I can look from the picture here and I can say, well, e is this signal here minus this signal. That's what the plus and minus here mean. This thing is plus this, minus this. So that's where I get this right here. I, t I call this y set point tilde because it has different units than the actual set point, right? This is the set point in physical units. This would be the set point in something like milliamps, OK? So I just give it a different name. And so that's where I get this here. And then I'm like, well, what is ysp tilde? Well, it's obviously um, km times ysp. That's where I get this part. And what is ym? Well, ym is gm times y. Remember, gm is the transfer function for the sensor. So now I have this. Okay. My goal is to get an get a equation that involves just the two things of interest. Because I'm interested in the set point changes, the two things of interest are the output and the set point. So I'm trying to eliminate everything else. So here's an equation. Now I can use it to eliminate e. Right? I can plug this thing right back into there. And then I'll have an equation that involves only y and, it, and the set point for y. That's it. Then I can rearrange that to get what I want. OK, so there it is. There's y equals that. Plug the e in right here. You get this. So I'm just, there's the e. Plug it in, you get this. OK, so now you have an equation that involves the set point and the output only. Take the part involving the output and move it to the left hand side, right? That'll give you 1 for this term, and then it'll give you what? Plus these four things multiplied together gp, gv, gc, gm. All times y equals this times y set point, and then just divide through, you'll get this. Just, it's just algebra at this point. Okay? All right. So now I've got my magical thing that I sought. This tells me how the output will respond to the set point. Okay? It's complex looking, right? Remember the good old days when, when you had just g? <laughs> okay. Now g is replaced by this thing. You can see g is in there. What we used to call g is now called gp, right? The process transfer function. But the response of how the output will, how the output will respond to the set point depends not only on the process transfer function, depends on the controller, thank God, because the whole idea is to design the controller so this looks good, as we'll see. It depends, it depends on the valve, the measurement device, so on and so forth, okay? All right. So. What I'm going to tell you is that if I give you a picture like this, this is the standard feedback system. Okay? The standard feedback system looks like this. There might be variations of this, but this is the basic one. If I give you a picture that looks like this, this is the answer. You don't have to rederive it. So I might give you a problem where I give you all these elements. You know, I give you GD and GP and G and so on and so forth. You just can plug them in this equation. Okay? So now you have a situation where if I asked you, to compute the response of this output to a change in the set point, 
and I gave you all the stuff over here. I gave you this gain, I gave you the controller transfer function, the valve transfer function, the process transfer function, what I miss, the measurement transfer function. And I told you what the set point change is. You could plug all those things in, right? Plug in, multiply, you know, you multiply this by the set point change. And in principle, you could take the inverse Laplace transform of that. <laughs> inverse Laplace transform of that. But as you might imagine, that's going to be kind of a gnarly looking um, quantity most times. Like you remember, some t you had to do this sometimes, and, and sometimes you, the inverse Laplace transform you needed to take wasn't in the table. But usually it was. Right? But the chances of what you need to take the inverse Laplace transform being in the table now are greatly reduced because this thing is going to be a lot more complex. Okay? So that's just the way it is, right? It's not desirable, but it's nothing you can do about it. Um, eventually, what I'm going to teach you is okay, so one thing you can do here is specify all the information, including the controller, and then you can compute what the controller does by finding this. Um, so the kind of thing you'd be looking for when it's all said and done would be something like this. Right, here's the output. Here's time. Let's say I implement a set point change like that. This is the y sp. Okay? So in other words, I've changed the desired value of y from this value to that value. Then I'd like, I'd like the controller you know, to do something like this. Kind of get up there quick. Well, dang. Sorry. Get up there quickly. Stay there. Not go too high. Not oscillate too much. Not be too slow. Okay. So the idea of what I've done now is, if I told you what GC is, so like I want to say GC is a P, a PI controller. Where to go? Here. Then I could give you values of the controller gain and integral time. You guys played around with this on the homework, right? The MATLAB homework. I gave you values, I think, and you you saw if they worked. And you could compute how well they do. If you didn't like them, you could pick new values and try again. You can see this won't be pleasant, because each time you pick new values, you'll get a new expression. You have to take the inverse Laplace transform again. right? And I'm not sure you can do it the first time, much less 20 times. So what are we going to do to simplify this? Well, one thing we can do is take this all into Simulink and just simulate this. Because Simulink will simulate closed loop systems just like open loop systems. And you've already seen that a little bit, and I'll show you more of that. But eventually what we're going to do, instead of specifying what the GC is and computing what this response is, I'll tell you what response I want, and then you'll find the controller that does it. Th that's design, right? The first problem is analysis. Like in design, when you take the design course, if someone specifies a distillation column and tells you to simulate that, that's an analysis problem. There's no design component. It's just like you got 100 trays, here's the feed, you, you, you code it up in Aspen Plus, you, you, you simulate it, you get the answer. Okay, there's no design component. If someone says, I have this mixture and I want this bottoms and, over, uh, bottoms and overhead product composition, design the column, that's a design problem. Okay? And so right now, what we're going to start off by doing is analysis. I'm just going to tell you all this information, you'll find the response. But eventually, you're going to do I'll tell you what I'd like the response to be, you'll design the controller to do it. That's, that's the ultimate goal. That's a little bit off, though. Okay, so that's the first problem. Now we'll do the other problem. That's that we know. We want to compute what the response of this output is to this disturbance, but we're going to assume at this point, this set point is not changing. If the set point is not changing, that means it's zero, because we're talking about deviation variables. If that signal is zero, then this signal is zero. Right? And that means the E here will just be minus this, right? because it's zero minus that thing. So you'll see that coming up. All right, so march through the diagram. Y equals that plus this, just as before. Now this term is not 0 because the D is not 0, because I'm telling you it's not 0 because it's changing. Okay. So there's, there's the YE thing, GP times U. There's the YD thing, GD times D. Now I just have to write what this U term is. This isn't changing for now. I just keep carrying that along. What is U? Well, U is GV times P. That's this thing. OK, what's P? P is GC times E. That's that. So I get this. Here's the error. Same thing as before, but again, this term now is going to be 0. Set point 0, then y tilde sp will be 0. And the error is just going to be 0 minus this signal here. And this signal, a ym, is right, gm times y. So it, this is the same thing I did before, but now this thing is 0 for this particular case. All right. So there you go. There's your error. 
plug that guy into there. Now you'll have an equation that involves only the output and the D, which is what you want. Okay? If you plug it in right there, you get this. Take the term involving Y here, move it to the left-hand side, gather the terms, divide by it, you get this. Okay? It has the same denominator as the other one. If you look at this denominator, exactly the same. Different numerator, though. Actually, a simpler numerator. Okay? So now, I could ask you to do the following, I would say. Compute the response to a disturbance change. So I give you the disturbance changing, you know, it's like a unit step change. I give you all these different transfer functions. You, you multiply, you, know, you evaluate all these, multiply that thing times D, try to take the inverse Laplace transform. But the goal here will be something like this. So here's like the disturbance versus time. And let's say the disturbance is here, and then there's a sudden change in the disturbance like that. Okay? I have no control over this. Then here's the y versus time. Here's the set point. For this case, the set point's not changing. Right? But what happens is when this disturbance takes place, which is right there, the output will tend to deviate from the set point. Because you, you know the way control works, right? You don't know something's gone wrong until you see it. So eventually, this disturbance enters the system through this transfer function. Eventually, it pushes y away from the set point. Because if y was at the set point and this changes, then y is going to move away from the set point. The goal of the controller is to try to drive the output back to the set point. In other words, eliminate the effect of this disturbance. And you know, that might look something like this. So this is the set point here. And then you know, the output might look something like that. This is the actual y. Okay, so you understand these are two different problems. One is, I want the set point to change and I want the controller to follow it. Okay? The other case is the set point's not changing, but it, the output deviates from the set point because there's some disturbance in the plant that causes it to do so. So these are the two problems of interest. All right. So now we've got this magical transfer function. And now you ask the question, what if I change both these things at the same time? So that's set point changing alone. This is disturbance changing alone. What if they change at the same time? Well, the system is assumed to be linear. That means superposition applies. That means this is true, right? So this was the transfer function between the set point and the output we derived. This is the transfer function between D and the output we derived. That's what happens if they change at the same time. Just the sum of the two effects. The system's linear. That's, what, that's why we love linearity, because effects add. Systems nonlinear effects don't add like this, right? All right, and sometimes this is written in a simplified form. This denominator is a little bit unwieldy. A lot, of, a lot of stuff's unwieldy here, but so this is often called GOL. So the transfer function for the controller, the valve, the process, the measurement device, lumped together, just called something called GOL, and you can rewrite, you can re just call it GOL and rewrite it like that. Okay? So GOL stands for open loop doesn't mean open loop in the sense I described earlier. It just is the, all these guys, oh, here we go. These things multiplied together, okay? You'll see this will come up again. Okay, so this is, again, something that will take you, I feel like, a few, I don't know, a few lectures at least, maybe a week or a little bit more, and a couple of homework assignments and some more examples, you'll start to get the idea, all right? Okay, so this is fine. This says, um, so now the idea is, and you'll see this on some homeworks probably, I can give you a block diagram that looks different than this. Okay? So obviously if I give you this block diagram and ask you what the transfer function is y and d, that's the answer. You wouldn't derive it. Right? But I might give you a different looking block diagram. At this point, you don't know why it would make it look different. You may not even understand why I made it look like this in the first place, much less why I would make it look different. But I could give you something that looks a little different than this. You could go through the same process and derive the transfer functions. The problem is if this diagram gets more complex, okay, so here's a classic case where it could get more complex. How are we doing on time, by the way? All right. So. This is a very common type of control arrangement. As usual, my drawing is less than ideal. 
looks kind of like an alien mushroom. That's a control valve. Okay. All right. So you've got a flow controller here, right? This is a flow meter. And so you're going to measure the flow, send that to a flow controller. It's going to manipulate this valve to get the desired flow coming out of this valve. Okay? This is a controller. It looks just like the example that we went through. Simpl it's greatly simplified. In this case, the process is the valve itself. Now, usually, how do you know what flow you'd like to achieve? Like, let's say this is coolant flow to a reactor. You know exothermic reactors, right? If you have an exothermic reactor, you have to cool it. Something's going on over there. I'm not even looking. Okay. All right. If you have an exothermic reactor, you have to cool the reactor. So this might be flow of coolant to the reactor, right? So how's this going to work? Are you just going to specify a coolant flow and just let it flow <laughs> constantly and then hope that cools the reactor enough? No. You're going to actually adjust the amount of flow you put for the coolant depending on what the temperature of the reactor is, right? So the idea is that you might have a whole other controller here, a temperature controller, that determines what that flow should be. This is called cascade control. We'll get into this, OK? Right, does this make sense? So you have a flow controller. This controls coolant flow to a reactor. Coolant flow, Mike, flow. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have a temperature controller on the reactor. And this temperature controller is going to decide what it like the coolant flow to be. And then this little controller will get it, right? So this is one controller writing a set point to another controller. It's like one controller inside another controller. It's called cascade control. The block diagram looks kind of like that. But inside here is another feedback loop for the flow controller. It's pretty complex looking. And this idea of algebraically, we'll see this. We'll, we'll I'll explicitly have a whole lecture on this. But the idea of algebraically deriving these transfer functions gets a lot less appealing if the block diagram starts to look more unwieldy. So what I'm about to do is give you a very general approach. It works really well to derive a transfer function for anything of interest. How are we doing here? Oh, not bad. All right. So the, the text will be kind of maybe hard to follow. But here's what I'm saying. I'm saying I aspire to find a transfer function between any variable in the feedback system. This, this z here is typically going to be y the output of interest, right? It could be anything, but typically we're only interested in y. zi is some input of interest. It'll either be the set point or the d, OK? So in other words, I want to either find y over y set point, or I want to find y over d. That's what I'm telling you, OK? This gives a formula for how to do this that you can skip all those algebraic manipulations. It says, first of all, in the numerator of this transfer function, and I'll have to explain this by an example, is the product of all the transfer functions that exist between these two signals, z and zi, okay? the output and the input. In the denominator is 1 plus this thing, pi e. It's the product of all the transfer functions that are in the feedback loop itself. Okay? So this is one of these things where if you tried to use this, you couldn't because you don't know what, what this means. <laughs> okay. So what I'll do is apply this formula and I can easily rederive the transfer functions that we just derived in, I mean, seconds as opposed to doing all the manipulations. For this example, it's not that critical because this block diagram is actually pretty simple. But when we get really complex ones, it'll, this will be very, very useful. Because you can apply this formula once when you do cascade control to the inner flow controller. And then you can apply it again to the temperature controller. And it, it'll, it'll be like orders of magnitude simpler. All right. So let's say we're interested in set point change. That means we're interested in the transfer function H hey, chalk. If I could open the chalk, I could get some. Oh, there we go. All right. So we're interested, let's say, to start with in this transfer function, right? I already tried to explain to you why we care about this transfer function, but it's how the output responds to a change in its set point. OK. So I want to apply this formula. So that's y, and that's y set point. So the first thing it says, this is going to be the product of all the transfer functions between y and y set point. That's what this would say. I have to go back to the diagram now. Sorry. OK. What is all the transfer functions between y and its set point? Well, it's that one that one, that one, and that one, right? If I draw a path between the set point and the output, I go through these four, tr four transfer functions. That's just a gain, but these four things, right? So those four things multiplied together is what I call pi f. 
that's where I got those. That's just those four transfer functions multiplied together. Okay. Then you have 1 plus pi e. It says, what's, what's pi e? That's the product of all the transfer functions in the feedback loop. Again, I have to go back. This is the feedback loop, right? Right there. It's a loop. It involves four transfer functions, that one, that one, and that one, and that one. So it's telling me pi e is all four of those things multiplied together. And that's where I got this thing. Okay? We also called that GOL. So that means that based on this analysis, then I can immediately say, oh, I can look here. This transfer function is pi f, which is this one, km. The order doesn't matter, obviously, but gc, gv, gp, 1 plus, I like think it's a g, well, different order, great. gc, gv, gp, gm. You understand? So the idea is that you can do this much more quickly. You just can you just look at the block diagram, you immediately write this, you immediately write this, you immediately have the answer. It's that, it's that easy. We can do the same thing for the other transfer function. It says, okay, what is the um, transfer function now between y and d? So we want to know this one. Okay, so first of all, the denominator is not going to change, right? Because the denominator was... 1 plus pi, where pi is everything in the feedback loop. And the feedback loop, what's in the feedback loop doesn't depend on which input you're talking about. That doesn't change. It's the same. The only thing that changes is the numerator. And the numerator, again, says find all, multiply all transfer functions that exist between d and y. Well, that's pretty easy. There's d and there's y. Just gd. That's the only thing in the path between them. Okay? And if you wrote there, there's the denominator, there's the gd. You got it. Okay? So this will end up being uh, easier to do. It doesn't make a big difference now, but it'll be easier to do once we have more complex um, block diagrams. So a very common problem I can tell you is that I'll make some perturbation of this diagram. That I, it's hard for me to explain now what, what kind of things I might do. Not that they're, I'm embarrassed about them. It's just that uh, you won't understand. So it might look a little bit different than this, and that means these transfer functions will be a little bit different, and you have to derive them. Okay, using the same, either the method here, which is a little bit laborious, or the simplified method here. Okay. Oh, holy smokes. I guess I do do this. Okay. All right. So what I want to do now, I didn't think we had this here, but um, I will apply this. So this, this is this, okay, there's two ways to look at this block diagram up here. There's three ways, actually. The first one is utter horror, right? Um, so that's a given. We'll all accept that. You might say... I could just tell you, I just came up with this. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to apply the method and, and get something. But I can also tell you, this is one of these cascade type of arrangements, right? So this, might, this controller here might be a controller that controls the flow. And this controller here might be a controller that controls the temperature. And the temperature controller determines what the set point for the flow controller should be. That's kind of what it's based on, if you want some physical meaning to this picture. All right, so you can see that if I gave you this picture, this line is just an artifact of cutting and pasting. It's not a line of the diagram, okay? Um, if I ask you to derive, now what do I want, for example? I want the transfer function between y and y set point, right? This would not be that much fun to algebraically write out all the equations, combine them, eliminate, you know. Um, so applying this formula works really well. So first thing I'm going to do is apply the formula to this inner loop here. Okay. So what am I interested in here? Well, I'm interested in g eliminating this inner loop. So if we look at this inner loop, the input is this thing. Too bad it doesn't have a name. Okay. And the output is this thing. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent that whole inner loop by a transfer function called G4. And then I'm going to be able to write it like this, right? If I can represent this inner loop by transfer function G4, then that picture will become this picture. So what is the G4? I just apply the formula, right? It tells me if you want a transfer function between any two points in the block diagram, in this case, that's the input and that's the output of interest, so I can eliminate this inner loop. Then first of all, in the numerator, it's all the transfer functions that are in the path between there and there. That's, uh-oh. <laughs> OK, I think you understand. Let's go. No. Um, so let's just say when, the, when, the, when it closes, we're done, all right, when the power goes out. All right, so now I feel a lot of pressure. I'm kind of choking. All right, so 
this is the forward path. It involves mm -hmm. these two transfer functions, that one and that one. That's where I got the numerator. Then you have one plus whatever's in the feedback loop. That's those three things multiplied together. That's where I got this. So that G4 right there is an equivalent representation of this whole feedback loop. Now you can apply the formula again to get the transfer function you actually want, which is y to the set point. The numerator is going to be all the things in the path between these two, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. Okay? And that's, I guess, what we call g. Well, they didn't want to write. I guess, first of all, I don't know why they did this. They wrote the transfer function from here to here. So that means that it's going to involve these four <laughs> things multiplied together in the numerator. Okay? GC1, G4, G2, and G3. That's where I got this. And then one plus everything in the feedback loop. Okay, that involve one, two, three, four, five different transfer functions, which is this. Now I can represent the system like this. Okay, that whole loop has now been replaced by G5. I replaced the inner loop with G4, now I've replaced this whole thing with G5. Okay? And so eventually you can get down to here. If you actually want to know what this is, then you have to plug G5 in here, right? There it is. And G5 involves G4, you can plug it in. You'll get some really messy looking thing, but at least it's tractable. Like, you won't like what you get at the end because it'll be hard to work with probably, but it, at least you could get it, okay? If you tried to do algebraic manipulations, you would probably never be able to actually get it. Okay, so we will see this again. This is just kind of like to give you some idea of why the formula is so useful and to convince you that you wouldn't want to apply just algebraic manipulations alone to find that one. Okay, so this is... So now I'm going to do this quickly because we're going to lose power and that's the end. And I'm not coming back to this because a single slide like a week from now after the exam, you won't even know what I'm talking about. Okay. So what this shows, this is just a little toy example, but what I'm trying to show you here is that you can find a transfer function automatically in MATLAB. This is just a simulating picture. It's not critical to what I'm doing. What I've done is specified a bunch of transfer functions just to show you what you can do. This is, so this command creates a transfer function, you might recall. That's the numerator. Just 6.3, this is the denominator, 5s plus 1. The valve is just a gain. These numbers come from somewhere. It's from an example in the book, but don't worry. That's the IDP converter. That's the measurement device. This is my controller. I'll explain this to you later. This is a PI controller. So that's the numerator. That's the denominator. I'll explain it. Maybe I'll explain it in a second. Then I can just issue this command, because I know the closed loop transfer function. In this case, I'm interested in disturbance here. Okay. So it looks like this transfer function because this is, so if I look at the disturbance to the output, it goes through just this transfer function, that's this thing, and then I can compute the one plus everything in the feedback loop. I, I just saying, I can do this all in, in Simulink, you get this nasty looking thing, right? This tells you what the numerator of the closed loop transfer function, the denominator of the closed loop transfer function. So this would just be a little bit easier than you having to multiply all these things out yourself, okay? So, all right, I've made it without losing power, it's impressive. Um, all right, so what we're going to do tomorrow, which is Friday, is I will go over the midterm from last semester. It's already posted up there along with the solution, so if you want to look at it beforehand, that's fine. Um, and you can ask any questions. We can do anything you want, but if, unless I hear otherwise, I'm just going to go through the exam and work it for you. Okay? Then the exam will be Tuesday. Uh, the exam will be open book. An open note, as we talked about, you'll have an hour and 15 minutes to do it. I've already put the exam together. I think it's easier than usual. That's my goal, okay? So we'll see if I accomplished it. All right.